football, the world's biggest sport. In today's video, I will tell you about three incidences, two murders, one attempted murder that took place in the name of the beautiful game. I'm also going to argue that football is one of the world's biggest religions and as a fanatic myself, I feel like I can explain these crimes in a little more detail. So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe and if you would like to talk to me directly, Discord links are in the description. Somebody said the football is a matter of life and death to you. I said, listen, it's more important than that. We start with Jordan Silva. Jordan was a 20 year old Brazilian amateur football referee. He was lynched, beheaded and quartered by football spectators after he stabbed a player to death in a match he officiated on the 30th of June 2013. So De Silva was refereeing an amateur football match in Maranhão in Brazil. He sent off a player by the name of Santos Abreu, who was 31. Now for those that don't know, in soccer, you get a yellow card for serious foul play. And then if you do it again, you get a red card and you have to leave the field, which means that your team for the remainder of the game plays with one man less. Now Santos Abreu refused to leave the field and began a fight with the referee. Abreu threw a punch which prompted De Silva to draw a knife from his pocket and repeatedly stab Abreu. Abreu died on the way to the hospital. When fans watching the game, including Abreu's family and friends, found out about his death, they invaded the pitch and stoned the referee before decapitating him, quartering him and putting his head on a stake in the pitch. Police chief Walter Costa was quoted as saying, one crime will never justify another. One suspect was arrested, however police were searching for two more people, including Abru's brother. Now a graphic video was surfaced online, which showed pictures of how the referee looked with his head on the stake. Go to Reddit, you can have a look, it's not a pretty sight. But the question you gotta ask yourself, why is this referee got a knife in the first place? And why is this footballer so mad over having been asked to leave the field in just an amateur game? Well, it's cause it means that much, but I'll come on to that later. Let's get on to our second murder. Now the FIFA World Cup is the biggest event in sports. Despite not being the most popular sport in the United States, football is the biggest game in the world and every four years the world watches as 32 teams battle it out over the course of a month for the right to be called the best in the world. In 1994 however, only 24 teams competed, the last time that would happen before the expansion in 1998 and Andres Escobar and his home country of Colombia were one of those lucky 24. The United States hosted the World Cup for the first time in 94 on June the 17th. It was the same day of the famed OJ Simpson white Bronco chase. Andres Escobar and his Colombian teammates began play the next day. They were part of Group A along with the United States, Switzerland and Romania. Expectations were high as the Colombians had lost just one time in their last 26 matches leading into the World Cup and they had only conceded two goals in this time. Now Colombia's first match came up against Romania on June the 18th, 94 at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, but the team looked sluggish and were completely outplayed. They lost 3-1. That meant their June the 22nd matchup with the United States was essentially a must-win match, a match that would prove to be tragic for Andres Escobar. The United States had tied its first match of the 94 World Cup, battling Switzerland to a 1-1 tie. Back then, the top two teams from each of the six groups advanced to the knockout stage, as did the top four third place finishers. So this was a must win for Andres Escobar and Colombia, who were already in last following the first day of Group A play. Escobar had been a defender essentially his entire career. It wasn't his job to score goals, it was his job to keep the other team from doing so. But on June the 22nd, 1994, he scored the wrong kind of goal, the dreaded own goal. In the 34th minute of the opening half, with the score tied 0-0, US midfielder John Hawks attempted a left-wing cross into the box, but there was Andres Escobar to deflect the ball into his own net. This gave the United States a 1-0 lead. The US went on to win the match 2-1. Colombia was able to win the last game, but they were eliminated. Following Colombia's elimination from the World Cup, Andres Escobar returned to his home country, determined to move on with his life despite pleas from his loved ones to lay low as fans were still very upset. 
Upon his return, he wrote a statement that appeared in a newspaper in Bogota, a statement that only a few days later would become one of the most chilling things ever written. Andres said, Life doesn't end here. We have to go on. Life cannot end here. No matter how difficult, we must stand back up. We only have two options. Either allow anger to paralyze us and the violence continues, or we overcome and try to best help others. It's our choice. Let us please maintain respect. My warmest regards to everyone. It's been a most amazing and rare experience. We'll see each other again soon because life does not end here. On the night of July the 1st, 94, Andrews Escobar, known by fans as the Gentleman of the Field, due to his extremely calm demeanour and clean play on the pitch, went out with friends. They hit up a few bars in Escobar's hometown of Medellin, but parted ways late in the night. At approximately 3am on the morning of July 2nd, Escobar was alone in a parking lot when he was approached by a group of men who argued with him about the unfortunate own goal. A scuffle ensued and Escobar was shot six times and left for dead. Later that night, Humberto Castro Munoz, a bodyguard for certain members of a powerful drug cartel and also a driver for brothers Pedro David and Juan Santiago Gayon Hanao, who were highly connected and present at the murder scene, confessed to the murder and were later sentenced to 43 years in prison. The sentence was then reduced to 26 years and he was released after serving just 11 years behind bars. Many still believe that the Galon Henao brothers ordered Munoz to kill Escobar, but there wasn't enough evidence to convict. More than 120,000 people attended Andres Escobar's public funeral and a statue of him was unveiled in Medellin in 2002. So now we go to February 2016. A referee in Argentina was shot and killed by a player he ejected from a game. The player retrieved a gun out of his bag after he received a red card, shot Cesar Flores, who was 48 at the time. He shot him in the head, neck and chest. Another player, 25-year-old Walter Zarate, was injured in the attack, but he survived. It all happened during the football match. A person connected to the police told local newspapers. They went on to say, we don't know exactly what took place, but it appears the player was angry, fetched a gun and killed him. The assailant fled the scene and authorities in the Cordoba province launched a manhunt. His identity was not released at the time. And violence is nothing new when it comes to Argentinian soccer by fans and players alike. Soccer hooliganism around the world is rife and has been there from day one. Now there are many other incidences of violence in football. 1985, the Heysel Stadium disaster where 39 people were killed and 600 injured. Go back to 1971 in Ibrox in Scotland. 66 people were killed when the collapse of a stairway barriers occurred after someone fell as fans were leaving the stadium. This led to a crush. We can go to the Hillsborough disaster of 1989, 97 people dead. The Ellis Stadium disaster April 2001, 43 stampeded to death and there's many many more so the question you've got to ask yourself why why does it mean so much why men kicking a ball has become this fanatical well let me break it down for you look at each club my beloved liverpool their motto is you'll never walk alone consider that the creed consider that the ideology if you go to other clubs they'll have their own motto which is a way to describe each club consider this the 10 commandments of each club so to speak and now let's have a look at the way the game is presented this applies to the nfl to basketball to all other sports but we'll stick to soccer for this one right the stadium well that's your church that's your holy site the disciples that's all the soccer players. The referee, consider the referee the angel, you know, the one recording everything you're doing. Consider the fans as the congregation. And who is the divine spirit? Who is the anointed one in all of this? The manager. See, we all have a sense of belonging. So we will go out to society to feel wanted and needed. By the time we hit the age of puberty, our own faculties tell us that we don't like being alone and we like having people around. So we look to society to find that. And given the fact that I and many people I know grew up in the Western world, football, NFL, basketball, ice hockey, cricket, whatever sport you want to name, is ingrained in the social fabric. So you go and join and follow a sports team that resonates with you. 
and by default you have hatred and contempt for your rivals who you will never meet, you will never know and they will never know who you are. But as you can see with the football hooliganism of the 1980s and the 1990s, particularly in Europe, it is no different than a religious battle between the Crusades or a political battle in the United States or just colonialism in whichever country you want to think of. The difference here though is that all, that all those events I mentioned, they actually mean something. When it comes to football, it's literally meaningless. There's no intrinsic value apart from entertainment. And again, you can break down the three murders or the two murders and the attempted murder. You can break that down to just some angry men. But when you see a correlation of events throughout the sport, there is something under the fabric that is quite sinister. Whether it's the tribe of Liverpool or the tribe of Manchester United or the tribe of the LA Lakers or Toronto Maple Leafs and the Vancouver Canucks. It seems when your team wins, you're happy. But when your team loses, there's racism on social media. There's violence in the streets. There's contempt in the media in general, the mainstream media. And all your rivals are laughing at you. So I come to you and I ask you because I don't know the answer. Why? Why does the game mean this much? Why this much effort, hatred, violence and bad will over what? Bragging rights? If I beat my rivals, I can throw it in your face and that's it. There's nothing else for me. Whether it's Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi or Mohamed Salah and all these players, they will never know who the fuck I am. So you, the onlookers, comment. Tell me why. Tell me why it means so much. Thank you for listening.